Hello there, very nice to have you on board. Welcome to the latest edition of Eamon and the Gaffers on podcast and on YouTube. Um, well, this time round, I'm going to speak to Gordon Strachan as a player. He started with Dundee, went to Aberdeen, Manchester United, Leeds United, Coventry City. As a manager, Coventry City, Southampton, Celtic, Middlesbrough and his home country of Scotland. He is the legend that is Mr. Gordon Strachan. Very good to see you, Gordon. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, mate. I'm doing okay. You're looking very well, to be honest with you. <laughs> you're a bit better as you get older. You're looking after yourself better. Age is something I want to talk to you about. You are the only player born before 1960 that has scored a hat trick in the Premier League. You retired, what, four, well, you were 40 when you retired? Yeah, I, uh, I kind of retired when I was about 37 because I wasn't, wasn't so much an influence at Leeds United. But when I went to Coventry, I found that I could still be an influence with the players around about you. And, and I think that's the secret of being a footballer. Are you still an influence one way or another? Uh, I felt that I was no longer an influence at um, uh, Leeds United. But when I went to Coventry, because I went there as a coach, and uh, I thought, yeah, the people around about me said I could be an influence to keep them up and help them relegation. So I played then. And it, it wasn't for the, well, I love playing. Once I get my on the football field, but I was looking forward to coaching at that point and, and calling it a day because I thought my body had enough. There were a lot of stories I remember at the time about um, what you would do to keep yourself in shape. And there was, there was this story that was going around that you had an obsession with bananas. <laughs> um, since how did you, did you do anything in particular? Sorry, no, listen, uh, people talk about marginals nowadays, um, but if you don't get the majorities right, like um, technique, but most importantly, fitness. And I, and I speak to our young kids at Dundee just now, but the importance of being fitness, because if you look at Liverpool and all that now, and that these teams, fitness is huge. I did all my basic fitness when I was a kid between about 12 and, and 20. And then I kept on top of it. Then I realized I could get fitter as I get older. And I was fitter at 35 than I was at 19 or 20, 21. Uh, and and to, to complement that at 33, 34, when I was still at Man United when I started changing my diet and doing more weights, um, eating the right things. I always slept well. But the, the porridge and bananas thing, I used to eat porridge and bananas every day. I had certain stuff. I used to go to my bed every afternoon and rest and sleep. Um, I learned that from Ken Gleeson and Sir Alex um, because Sir Alex didn't even let you go and shopping with your wife in the afternoon because that was wasting energy. So all these things at the end helped me to keep going. But... It made no difference all that without the, the, the hard work where you're at Aberdeen when you're running and you're, excuse my language, you're thrown up, you get up and you go again and you go again and you go again and, and you get pushed or cajoled or bullied, whatever you call it, to get fitter. What does that make you like to live with? I mean, would you have been quite boring? Would you have been quite no, dull? Oh, I think I'm, 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 I'm great fun. Matter of fact, if, you know, if I wanted a mate, I would be it, you know, because I think... So the kids were asking, asking me the other day there, what's good about football? I said, listen, I've been laughing since I was 12 years old and I continue to 63, laughing every day, whether it's been on the football field, training field. That's why I've been married for 47 years. We can have a giggle and a laugh and a joke. It would seem to me that it might be more fun, it may not be, being a player than being a gaffer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the gaffer thing, you get this... You get this, especially in the international team, you get this glow of satisfaction when you when you win. There's nothing like coming into a dressing room. You see people celebrating, the, the players, the kit manager, the, the office staff when you're walking down. And you go, and you know that the Holy Scotland um, is happy. And you just get this glow of satisfaction going, I helped to create this somewhere along the line. And you get a fantastic kick. But when you get beat, you go to this low down here. So it's never a balanced it. And it's something to deal with this this real low down there that you have to deal with sometimes. And I'm afraid uh, when you're a football player, you could, you know, if Sir Alex attacked you and gave you the hairdryer, within three hours, you're laughing and giggling with your mates about it, you know, you know what they were doing while you were getting attacked. You could look around the dressing room, you could how oh, you're like that against the wall, and they're all going, how? No, I can't do that, you know. So you always had a giggle with you guys, with, with, with football management, um, you, and the funny thing about it is everybody asks me, young manager, how do you deal with it? 
how do you get over this defeat? And you go, sorry, you don't. There's nothing you can take. Some people take alcohol. I don't drink as a manager. So I just have to suffer with it. The only problem, if you take alcohol, you wake up the same morning, the next again morning, the same problems and a hangover. I'd rather just have one or the other. Gordon, let me ask you about um, influences. And um, I suppose Aberdeen was where it happened for you. That was the, the breakthrough, was it? That's where you, you well, first I, your I name? Started, I started at Dundee and I made my debut in the reserve team at 15. I was nine stone two or something like that. And I, and, and I, and I played a day in an era where you played cards with the guys, with first team players, I lost my wages. That's when I learned not to gamble. Great lesson. I got sent off at 15 um, at Dundee United game. I was playing in a game where there was a the left back was a, there was twins. Left back was Joe White and the left winger was Sandy White. And these two kept kicking me. I was only 15. And near the end of the game, some, one of them kicked me again. And I got up for the ground, covered in mud. And these two were peering over me and I wasn't sure which one it kicked me so I punched one and kicked the other and got sent off so um, I never played for four Did you ever get sent off again? You didn't, you... No, I got, I got sent off once in 880 games Amazing, amazing Because I always knew where to go and step off and it was the same with management and things like that but I really learned how to be a professional when I went to Aberdeen the discipline um, to a certain extent with Billy McNeil when I first got up there. But then when Sir Alex came, your whole lifestyle changed. Um, wow. Everything about y your life had to be about football at that point. I think at that point, uh, it was playing football, but it was the same as the ordinary guy. I could go to the social club, I could go do this, I do that, eat rubbish, do this. And never had it in my mind that I had to win games of football every week. It seemed like, yeah, if you win, you win. But it's, it's that point when it, it, you realised we have to win every game. My, 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 my whole lifestyle has to be around uh, football. I think a lot of people think it was Alex Ferguson signed you for Manchester United, but it wasn't. There's another big influence in your, your life. I think Grant signed me because Alex didn't come till about... 86, October 86. 86. I'll tell you what, it was 4th of November, 86. Yeah, yeah. It's etched in my memory. There, it's burnt in there. <laughs> Is that and, good or bad? <laughs> yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, in the 86 World Cup, his room was next to mine, which was a problem because you know fine well he's got this nervous cough. When he's nervous, he's got <coughs> <coughs> and he spats a wee bit. So before big games, I couldn't get to sleep because he was coughing up all night and he was wanting to pick a team and he couldn't. And he'd pop his head in the morning, his hair was sticking. Oh, what do you have? Oh, well, okay. So, and he, he said to me, I said, did you leave Aberdeen? He went, ah, I'd only leave for two clubs, son. He says, uh, Barcelona and uh, Man United. And I went, Hope the crisis Barcelona you go. <laughs> <laughs> because I felt we'd done enough with each other, you know. Anyway, so Alex coming and I said, Oh, it's got to be different. And for about two months it was quiet. I thought, oh, this is a change. And then we played somewhere. Could have been Wimbledon and all hell broke loose. And I went, Told you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to Man United. It took a wee while to get going. I said, if you give them time. It will happen. It was a different ball game. Whereas Aberdeen, you have to look after the money, buy players, take time for them coming through. Man United, we won it instant. And I think when he got to grips with that, that it wasn't his money that he was spending, and he had to do that and, and get instant players ready, he got it. What was the Celtic experience like? I mean, you were very successful there, but... but yeah. All the times with the fans, wasn't it? It was something that, if I didn't have all the kind of character-building moments... That yes. I had through a player, manager, and all the rest there, um, leaving Co Coventry, I couldn't have dealt with it. And then I thought, I could deal with that. I thought, this will be easy. Then you get in there and you think, no, nothing prepares you for this. Nothing at all prepares you for this. And I think only maybe Barcelona, Real Madrid has kind of got the same edge to it, media-wise. But these, there's moments you think, wow. How good was that? You're in the Champions League, yeah. beating Man United, being AC Milan, beating Benfica, um, all these kind of things. And it's funny enough, you forget all the bad days, the depression days, you forget them all. Because the fact is, you made so many people happy on many occasions. You see, it's, it's fascinating listening to that because there are those who would say, whether it was you, whether it's Martin O'Neill, whether it's Neil Lennon, whoever it is, they might say, yeah, but it's easier. Your success is going to be easier there because, uh, and I don't say this, but you, you know there'll be an inference. It's Absolutely. Only, 
yeah, it's it's Scotland. Yeah. Um, but yet, the, listening to you there, you're telling me it's actually more intense. It was a, a colder, a pressure cooker. It's basically between two clubs all the time. It's like Real Madrid and and and. and when England, it could be five or six clubs, it could be a bit more. The different areas, it could be more. There's a feeling when you come to the west of Scotland, you go, wow, what is this? And mm-hmm. Which you've got nowhere else. And, and you have to win. You, you test yourself every day as a person. Uh, but again, life lessons, I, I used to try and stay sane by doing the northern media, but I used to learn Spanish for an hour every day, at five o'clock to six, just to clear my mind. It's experience I thought I would only do three years because of... But I end up being four. And Gordon, did you, I mean, if I read it correctly, you didn't win the title in that fourth year, am I right? Yeah. 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 Rangers won the title. Um, and am I right in saying you walked away? Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a big thing, isn't it? That's a big thing. You could have stayed there. I could have, but I would have went mad. Um, um, so I just felt like it was, I'd done everything I could at the club and I given you know when you, you, your body feels of that's it that's it it's like when I played football in Leeds I went wow I don't know if I can my body can take anymore and it was like it's, it's, I, I think I would have to rejig the team again and I think it was right that somebody else come and try to rejig it rather than me and I don't know you've got to have that anger and drive to be a manager I know far more now about being a manager I really do I don't know about systems I, I watch it better I take it in I understand it better but I've not really got that anger anymore. So you saying to me now you're you're finished with management? I've been interested in youth football for twenty years, and and I'm at Dundee now, a technical director, which I'm the technical director, and I don't do it for money. It's just that somebody's given me a blank canvas, said go and work with kids and coaches, and put your ideas together. What I do is work with the coaches, work with the players, and I've spent a lot of time on the Zoom with the kids just now, and I love it. If something really come up, and I thought you're really hungry for this. I go, yeah. But if I'm not, there's no chance of me doing it. Absolutely no chance of me doing it. Because the one thing you don't do in, in life is, is, is kid anybody on and take the money for the sake of take money. You see, I loved your approach at Celtic. And I, and I know there's a romanticism with Celtic and there is, you know, uh, a lot of people, and it's like fairy tale stuff with them. But there was a time Celtic at Celtic where you were practical, that you played a game where you were winning, you were going to get results. And a lot of people would say, um, are you an entertainer or are you a winner? And there's this lovely quote I was looking for there. You said in 2009, I wasn't going to pretend I came here as a Celtic supporter. I don't believe in kissing badges to get your support. I don't know the words off, and this made me laugh, Fields of Ath and Rye. But from today, I have become a Celtic supporter. Now, I get that. Yeah. As a man who was an outsider coming into the tradition, how did that go down? And I think it, it means more because, you, you know, if you're in a Celtic family, it's, it's just, that's what you do. You, yeah. you have kids, they become Celtic supporters and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and it goes on and goes through the day. I had my choice. Well, the support, you know, Hibs when I was a kid, I did that. I support Hibs when I was 15. But when you get to Celtic and you go, I love this club and I love them doing well. So I become a supporter through hard work and that was that was even against the kind of negativity you know when um i joined i mean i think brendan had twenty thousand people there i didn't have 20 people there seriously and and some of them didn't want to show who i was it's funny you know everywhere i go now you'll find a celtic supporter everywhere in the world same with man united but more so there's it everywhere you know matter where you go You'll be sitting in the toilet next door. Hey, wee man, how's it going? Look, I thought you did a great job. Thanks, pal. Thank you. You'll find them everywhere. And not one is negative. Everybody goes, oh, great job. And they're a bit like you. Listen, I know you've got a bit of stick, but brilliant. And these people who you meet, they yes. don't be like it. The ones you can touch, see, meet. Yes. They make all the difference. Uh, the ones in social media, yes. they're out there somewhere hiding in a cloud. And... They don't really count, really. If you want to make them count, they can't. But reality is when people touch you, shake your hand, all the rest there. Yeah. That is, you, is, if you're walking along, say, well done this morning, Amy. great stuff. Enjoy. And you get a kick from that. And <laughs> I don't think, see when I say to fans, I'll come and say, thanks for the job you done. We went, that was great. Made, made, it was very good. And I've turned and said, thanks for saying that, it's made my day. And they'll look at me and go, what? I say, well, it does. It does. You've made my day. It's lovely also to think they think you're approachable um, as well. Could I ask you, uh, my friend, 
what was it like to manage to be in charge of your country? Um, I've got to say I enjoyed that. I really enjoy that. I, I love creating things and I love creating, I love, as I get, I love people. And I, I think that we created a fantastic squad there who would do anything for you. I mean, literally anything. Turn up with injuries, do this, do that. I love working with them. <laughs> and the, the good thing about this, the national coaches, you know, you're on the football world. You probably spoke to managers, probably two or three in the dressing room that would be delighted to get rid of it. But they can't get rid of them because they're on 150 grand a week in another four years. The Scotland thing is, you don't pick them because you don't fancy them. And you just come away and say, ah, didn't they fit the system? Yeah. So I could get this group of people around me. Yeah. The other thing is, I only had to do two press conferences um, every couple of months. So I was away from that side of it. I didn't have to report to a chairman or anything like that. The SFL let me get on with it. It's just so unlucky that we're just a goal away from qualifying and there are two points here. And when I look back at it, I think we were in really hard groups and things like that. So we just needed one goal for somewhere to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked me after I left the Scotland thing, would you come back and be a manager? I said, yeah. If I could work with these players I've been working with the last five years, because I just thought they were terrific bunch of lads. I, I, I thought it was a great job. And, and I would have, the more I look at it, if you give me two weeks or three weeks, if you said you want to stay, I would have stayed again. Um, but um, that was taken out of my hands because my contract was up. This COVID situation, this awful pandemic situation, and, and the first thing I want to talk about is international football. There's going to be casualties in the fixture list, and you've got the Euros already uh, suspended. You've got the World Cup in Qatar looming and all that sort of thing. How are they going to fit it all in, Gordon? Well, I think you're asking somebody who is a bit like yourself, not got a clue. Um, I've always been, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to go this, that and everything. I think to be the head of European football or English football or Scottish football at the moment must be horrendous. And everybody's telling you what to do because we all threw out ideas. But we threw out ideas without the consequences. When you threw out an idea, you've got to say legally where we are, medically where we are, logistically where we are. And we don't really know. Um, the Scottish game... Might they come back to crowds till January? Yeah. You know, so I really don't know how we get about it. Are there not going to be casualties? Now, for, you look at international tournaments. You look at the FA Cup. Well, I think you could, you could do with the international tournaments. You could do without those? I think you could do without this. I and, think you could do without... I think they will end up doing without those. You could do without them. You could do without cup ties. But Champions League? Champions League will come back. I don't know how they've got to bring it back. Um... I watched the um, German League German games. They're not fit enough yet to play. If you watch after 60 minutes, everything, every the standard drops, the tackling drops, the closing down drops. So it's very, very hard um, because there's so many things. So in my mind, it's in Scottish football at the moment and that's hard enough to deal with. Then you think, okay, you ask me about the Champions League. But if you ask me who's in the Champions League, I go, yeah, everybody's got a clue. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's got a clue now. Mm. You just want to call it a day. It's called a day with the Champions League. Call it a day with the National League. You want to call it a day unless you're in it. <laughs> that's right. But I think it's, it's most important that you, you sort your leagues out first. I think that's a, that's where people put their money into. The fans put their money into. It's, you, you've got a choice of watching Champions League, or, or um, but I think somehow you've got to finish your leagues off if that can be done seriously. And if it means playing every three days, then fine. Just get on with it. You definitely believe see out one campaign in terms of the leagues. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, that's not going to happen in Scotland, though, is it? It's not going to happen in Scotland for... Yeah, no, that's it. That's no, no yeah. you, 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 you in agreement? You happy with the way it concluded in Scotland? Well, there's, there's things like... Patrick Thistle, for, take, for instance, the, champ, the championship. They had one game extra to play and a one point behind Queen of the South. And they've been relegated with eight games to go. Now, that is unfair. I think the English leagues... I think you have to see them out. And I think they're big enough, strong enough, uh, and, and got enough finance to definitely the Premier League to see it out and the Championship. How much player consultation do you think there should be? I mean, you know, if you are a manager, you're a gaffer, and a, and a player turns up to you and says, boss, I, I don't feel that I can play in this. I've got uh, a relative with underlying health issues or whatever. Should that player be respected? Absolutely. And, and you've got to remember, it's like anything. It's entirely up to you if you want to go back. Same with schooling. It suggests you go back. It's entirely up to you. Your, your family is the most important thing. We all know that. But I'll tell you what, if you don't want to play, I think everybody will understand that. Not a problem. You do that. But 
let us all decide for ourselves what, what, what to do. Don't try and bully us into corralling us into one way or another. You know, whether there is Project Restart, uh, playing behind closed doors, when will fans be readmitted? Um, what competitions? And this is why I get back. I just wonder, will there be a League Cup next year, for instance, um, in, in, in Scotland or England? Get, just get rid of them for a year. Let the players, you know, breathe. I, I don't yeah. think it makes any difference. All the money is in Champions League and Premier League football. The rest, as you know, they'll put it to tender. Somebody can pick it up. You know, the club should financially be able to say, right, we can... We can con- continue without being in the League Cup. Because sometimes you get knocked out of the League Cup after one round. So that means you have to financially balance it for that. So I think that I don't think it'd be a problem with League Cup's gone missing. And but you go still got the Champions League Premier League. But that's what anybody wants to see now. And even international football now. Do we really bother that much about it? I don't think they do. I think everybody's concentration on kids, kids especially, um, and even the FA Cup to a certain extent, will only get excited maybe semi-final. And... And to be fair, the build-ups for a Liverpool-Man United game are massive compared to even the cup finals now. If you look at Sky and the build-up they get, they're massive because they know what's important. It's Premier League, Champions League. Then it comes international foot. People used to think it was international foot. It's nowhere near that now. It's down here in third. You mentioned kids there. Two of your own became yeah. footballers. What sort of footballing father were you? And... And was it hard because the two lads, I mean, you know, obviously they play the game to a certain level, but yeah. they obviously didn't have the, the luck. Maybe they didn't have the ability um, that, that you had as well. What, what was that like to watch that? Or did you encourage them or did you say, no, don't do it? Oh, no, no. You could never say don't do it. But we, we, you got up in the football family. They like football because they, they seen stars when they were younger and wanted to imitate the stars. That's what they want to do. Forget where they went. But as a father... I know fine well they gave everything they could. They got a maximum out of their cells. It's the same as a player. So when they finished their football career, when did he finish early because he had um, stress fractures in his back and he got in his body, Craig? And, and, and matter of fact, Feyenoord wanted to buy him when he was 17 at Coventry. He got these stress fractures and he had to retire from football. And he's went into something else now and he's running foundation. He's now a head scout at Celtic. And so he's got a maximum out of his cell because of that. And our Gavin, who was a terrific technical player, but physically he couldn't get about the pitch. Gavin would just get to the action when he was leaving and going somewhere else, you know. Um, so, but technically it was wonderful, but he had to think about his football. So now he's coaching. And again, he gets the most out of that. Because uh, he, yeah, I don't know if you know it, his boss, what together, is Dan Ferguson. So oh. Gavin and Dan and what together. Yes. So the Ferguson and Strack and Think Partnership got together again. So, but I was a dad who never said anything to them, really. They would have to come to me for advice. Uh, uh, it's up to you, carry on. I'm here if you need me. It was unfortunate because <laughs> the two of them signed for commentary at the same time. They'd never heard me swearing until they went to training. <laughs> so they, they went back and said to mum, you know dad swears? <laughs> because I never swore in my life. And, and when you talk about plenty 40, when I was 41, there were shorty players in the reserve team. So I played in the reserves. Uh-huh. And Gavin was playing as well. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Very awkward moments during the game when he shouts, Dad, Dad, g- g- boss, boss, Dad, Gaffer. <laughs> Dad, uh, and I said to him during the game, make up your mind, what do you want to call me? <laughs> boss, Dad, Gaffer, but So these wonderful moments, uh-huh. no other fathers had that I played with my son in a professional game of football. And we went 4 1. Brilliant. You know, so it was a passing movement. Yeah. I was involved, he was involved, and the guy scored. And so you celebrate. So me and Gavin celebrate the boy at school. And someone else come across and I went, oh, 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 oh. If you've got no call strike and not been involved in the game, piss off. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon, where do you think, just a couple of more questions for you. Where were your happiest or best years as a player? And then I'm going to ask the same question as a manager. Player, first of all. I've always found that difficult because if, if I picked, say, Leeds, I yeah. feel like letting the guys doing Aberdeen and Manchester United and, and, yeah. Bur- and Dundee. Okay. And it, I really, I find it very hard because, as I said to the kids the other night there, I generally feel I've been laughing since I was 15. Brilliant. You know, j- just, the, the, the thing about Leeds was the only time somebody specifically said, we must do this or the club's in trouble. So you get a real kick out of that. But you cannot tell me you didn't have, a, the fun that I had with Robson, McGrath, Whiteside, all these guys. I mean, I could keep 
I, I can make a, a living out of just telling stories about them. And the same when you go to Celtic, you've got Tommy Burns and you've got these people, Aberdeen, with Alec Ferguson. And even I was talking to um, Alec McLeese last night about something. I says, I've got to say, it was sometimes the most horrific things in your life happened in that dressing room, but we're now laughing about them and rolling about laughing. So I've, generally, I've, I've just been laughing for 15 years as a footballer. Right? Then somebody says, do you find you sticking it as being a manager and continue? I'll have a bit of that as well. And do you say, you know, from 15, it's one of those sliding door things. Things could have been different. You know, you could have passed some exam at school that would have, people would have said, well, you should be a vet or something. Or you could have, you know, joined the army or something. Do you ever think that, what would you have been in real life if you hadn't had that dream of laughing your way through football? Um, what would you have been? I think it was something with numbers. I was always good with numbers. Um, and my mum went in a bad mood with me because I left school early at 15. I didn't take on my final exams because I felt I had to catch up on other people because of the size of me. But the sliding door thing, you're right. Um, I look back on a couple of things in my life and go, wow. If I didn't go that direction, I would have maybe went there. Because I tell the story about me being, when I was 15, I got released by Hibs. In February, Dundee asked me to go full-time in the summer. So I wasn't 15 yet, but I could go full-time. And about May, I was playing football with my mates. And one of my mates came and said, your dad's after you. And usually that means you're school boy. Tell him you've never seen me. I'm off. Right? <laughs> so I went back three years later. And you'll know this name. You remember John Ashton, the boy who played left, left winger for Man United in the country? Yeah, yeah, John Ashton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His dad was a chief scout at Manchester United in 1972. Uh -huh. And he was sitting there with another guy. And he says, listen, my dad says, these guys they like to sign for Man United. And he says, you'll meet George Best and all that, who was my hero at the time with Jimmy Johnston and Pat Stan. So we thought about it and we went, my dad went, no, really, you promised to go to Dundee, haven't you? Yeah, that's a good idea. Right, we got to Dundee. Sorry, we're not coming to Man United. So we, we, we kept our word. And we all, we all thought we'd get a, a chance earlier to Dundee to be, become a footballer. And 12 years later, I ended up at Man United because I made that decision and I went to Man United and I ended up at 27. And similar to when I was at Dundee and I played with Dundee, my second last game with Dundee, I got beat 6-1 six, six at Queen of the South. And you think, you know, that oh, Jesus, what am I going to do? I'm never be a football player. And about seven days later, I joined uh, Aberdeen. Only because the manager of that team was best of mates with Billy McNeil. And Billy said to him, how did the game go? He says, how did the striking do? Well, they got beat 6-1. But he kept going right to the end. And Billy made his mind up with that. And you, see, you think back, to, if I had chucked it, you know, if I chucked it that night, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. <laughs> you what would know? you be doing? Me? Oh, yeah, you'd have to get a real job. Exactly. Somebody said, how long have you been working? You go, never worked in my life. I, uh, seriously, I did. I have worked in my life. I had a milk round when I was a kid between 12 and 15. <laughs> and, 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 and at Dundee, because your wages got cut in the summer, yeah. you had to find another job. So I, I went to Timex for two weeks. And I, I got told to leave there as well because I sent 2,000 watches to the wrong place. Um, <laughs> uh, so Easily done. Easily so done. Easily done, yeah. Gordon Strachan, OBE, it has been an absolute pleasure, my friend, um, talking to you. Um, if we were to say at the end of all of this, you know, if um, you know, we're talking about your managerial career, we're talking about your playing career, um, how would you like people to remember you? If they could sum you up, if you could have it on your, your tombstone, your headstone, what would it be, do you think? <laughs> well, so I was talking about my tombstone the other day, and it's something that says, because my first, my first game at Celtic was a European time, I got beat 5 nothing at Bratislava. You know, you went in that deep depression. Yeah. I said, I would have it in my tombstone saying, this is still better than Bratislava. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, I, th I think, if, 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 if you said to me, if, if my teammates are sitting having a drink somewhere, and all they said to me that was, he was a smashing teammate, that'd be, that'd be great. You Good, know? man. Well, you've been a smashing interviewee. Really appreciate it. Uh, Eamon and the Gaffers, Gordon Strachan. It's available on YouTube. It's available on Facebook as well. It's available on podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. Gordon Strachan, thank you very much. See ya. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe.